Okay, well, thank you, everybody, for coming today. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce today um, one of our nation's leading experts in election law and democracy, a real national treasure, Professor Rick Hassan. Professor Hassan is the Chancellor's Professor of Law and Political Science at the University of California, Irvine. It goes without saying that he's a nationally recognized expert in election law, including voting and campaign finance regulation, two issues that are near and dear to the Women Center. Professor Hassan is co-author of the leading casebook on election law. He founded and co-edited the quarterly peer-reviewed publication, The Election Law Journal, for a decade from 2000 to 2010. He is the author of more than 80 articles on election law issues, published in many journals from the Harvard Law Review to the Supreme Court Review and everywhere else. And he was elected to the American Law Institute in 2009. His op-eds, his commentaries, and his quotes have appeared in publications across the country from the New York Times to the Washington Post to Politico to his um, regular appearance on Slate. Um, many of us here at the Brennan Center and across the country have contact with Rick every single day because he writes the essential and often quoted election law blog and presides over a related listserv. And nobody involved in democracy law at all can afford not to be on that listserv. We really benefit tremendously from his um, leadership in that every single day. We are here to talk about Rick's newest book, The Voting Wars. From Florida 2000 to the next election meltdown, which was just published this summer by the Yale University Press. This is an issue that is also um, extraordinarily important to us here at the Brennan Center, having um, worked on these voting issues um, since our founding, and it's a critical component of our democracy program. It is also an issue of profound interest to the nation. It is something uh, our, we have been experiencing a real crisis in our democracy, and it is something that people are talking about at political conventions, um, in living rooms, um, and in newsrooms across the country. And we are really delighted to have a, a real um, national expert to tell us a little bit about where we are and how we got here and, and maybe how we can get out of here. Um, and uh, we, I highly recommend um, the voting wars. This is required reading for anybody interested in the topic. And I'm delighted to turn this over to Rick to tell us how it's going. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon. Can everybody hear me OK? Yes. Uh, th thanks for the very kind introduction. And it's such a pleasure to be here at the Brennan Center, which does very important work. It has for some time. Uh, many people. Uh, uh, now are concerned about these issues, but the Brennan Center has been at the forefront of looking at them uh, for now, I guess, I'm not sure how long, 12 or 13 years, and really doing extremely important work. And so it's, it's a special pleasure uh, to be here. Um, so, uh, let's see. There we go. All right, so uh, I, I want to start off with uh, a hypothetical. I want you to imagine that. Uh, uh, we're coming up to uh, an election day, and it's a very close contest between the Democrat and the Republican for president. This shouldn't be too hard for you to imagine. And uh, let's say that the, uh, the election comes down to the uh, state of Wisconsin, and it's 10 electoral votes. Uh, Wisconsin has been the scene of uh, some very nasty, protracted partisan struggles over the last uh, few years over uh, uh, rules related to labor unions. Uh, there have been a number of very close uh, elections. And uh, throughout the night, uh, the results come in. And they don't come in from one central place. They're coming in from all across the state. Because in the United States, you know, we don't have a single election on election day. We have 13,000 elections. We have election results coming in from different counties, from precincts within counties. And the, uh, in this uh, election uh, for president, uh, coming down to Wisconsin, the votes are seesawing back and forth between the Democrat and the Republican all night. Uh, at about 3 o'clock in the morning, all of the results are in, at least that are coming so far, and the Democrat is ahead by 200 votes. At this point, uh, Republicans start uh, complaining about voter fraud. John Fund, formerly of the Wall Street Journal, goes on to Wall Street Journal Opinion Journal Television and talks about, quote, bizarre anomalies going on uh, with the vote totals in Dane County, 
which is where the University of Wisconsin uh, is uh, uh, in Madison uh, is, as well as a pattern of fraud in Milwaukee, not coincidentally uh, home to many uh, Democratic poor and minority voters. And uh, the voter fraud claim gets picked up by blogs across the uh, 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 country and starts to make it into the conservative media. The next morning, uh, Kathy Nicholas, who is a, uh, an election official in Waukesha County, uh, Wisconsin, uh, holds a press conference. She explains that uh, she had all of the vote totals that were coming in from the various parts of her county stored on her laptop, and she forgot <coughs> to include the city of Brookfield in her totals, 15,000 votes. When you add in the votes from the city of Brookfield, it turns out that the Republican is up by 7,000 votes. So no longer a 200 Democratic majority, but a 7,000 uh, Republican majority. Well, now it's the left's turn to complain. The liberal blog Think Progress writes, uh, critics are saying there are only two possible explanations for this bizarre development, foul play or incompetence. The uh, URL of the blog post is a little more blunt. Kathy Nicholas, crook or idiot. <laughs> it turns out that Kathy Nicholas used to work for the Republican Party in the legislature, and she is a Republican election official. No mind it, though, if you take a look right here, you see this woman standing right behind Kathy Nicholas. She's a Democrat, Ramona Kitzinger, and her job is to make sure that uh, Nicholas is, is doing things fairly. And at first she comes out and says everything looks fine. <coughs> the next day, though, through the county Democratic Party, she issues a statement. And the statement reads, I'm 80 years old. I don't know anything about computers. I don't know where the numbers Kathy was showing me ultimately came from, but they seem to add up. I'm very, very confused. The story you have just heard is 100% true. Only the election has been changed to protect the innocent. This was an election for the state Supreme Court uh, justice seat that was opened last summer between incumbent Republican David Prosser and uh, the uh, uh, challenger Democrat Joanne Kloppenberg. It was a very nasty race. You can see here a union ad that quoted from a leaked email in yeah. which Prosser <clears throat> called the Chief Justice of the Court a Democrat a, quote, total bitch. Uh, the uh, election went into overtime, uh, and eventually it turned out that the Government Accountability Board determined there was no fraud, but there was incompetence on the part of the election official. And so I worry about what happens when the next presidential election is decided like this. Twelve years after Bush versus Gore, could Florida 2000 happen again? And would the next meltdown be worse? And I'm going to argue that uh, thanks to social media, if we do have another election meltdown, it would actually be much worse than we saw in 2000. So just a, mi a moment on why does it matter. So uh, here's a page I took from Wikipedia, which is where I get all of my information. And uh, it shows you the presidential election results from Egypt in uh, 2005, Hosni Mubarak got 88.6% of the vote, compared to someone named uh, Ayman Noor, who got 7.3% of the vote. In the uh, 2012 election, I believe, uh, Mubarak got 100% of the vote. Very effective campaigner. Uh, <laughs> our elections are only as, uh, uh, as good and as valid as the people's confidence in them. And so nobody believes these numbers when I put them up, because we don't have confidence that Egypt, at the time of Mubarak, had elections uh, that were fair and free. And we know what this led to. Here's Turner Square in Cairo, summer of 2011. And here's Moscow in December 2011, where it was widely agreed that the uh, election there in Russia was marred by fraud uh, and uh, election official manipulation. And here's the United States in November 2011. The top picture is of a true the vote rally. No Chicago style politics in Texas. Voter ID works for me. And below is a uh, uh, a, this is a, a, um, a union rally in Philadelphia. Voter ID equals poll tax. So the voting wars have come to the United States. And the question is, how are things going to go uh, should we have another a meltdown? Um, and so the book starts by talking about Florida. Now, some of you are old enough to remember Catherine Harris. Catherine Harris was the Republican Secretary of State in Florida. 
she was also the co-chair of uh, Bush's campaign committee. And it's worth pausing at that moment, at this point for a moment. Uh, we're the only country, mature democracy, where you could have the chief election officer of the state also being one of the uh, chairs of a committee to elect one of those candidates. And the partisanship extends it all the way in Florida. It wasn't just Katherine Harris. It was the election supervisors who were Democrats or Republicans and reached different decisions on whether or not to purge, purge voters based on whether they were Democrats or Republicans. And to the county uh, canvassing boards, how many votes were counted for Gore depended on whether they were Democrats or Republicans doing the counting. And of course, we had problems, I know this is near and dear to some people here at the Brent Center, with ballot design and the so-called butterfly ballot, which caused many Democrats to mistakenly overvote, vote two votes, uh, or to cast a vote for Pat Buchanan rather than for Al Gore, leading to the so-called Jews for Buchanan voters in Palm Beach County, Florida. And so what we saw in Florida was a problem with partisanship, which, with localism, with technology, and with what everybody agrees was an out-of-control uh, court subverting the democratic process. I think everybody agrees on that. What they don't agree on is whether the out-of-control court was the Florida Supreme Court or the U.S. Supreme Court. So we had courts dividing along ideological or party lines as well. And so what's happened since 2000? In many ways, things have gotten worse. So this is around the time uh, where you start, you're going to start seeing, I think there's already been a few stories, about the armies of lawyers being canvassed by the, uh, being, being uh, uh, corralled by the campaigns. The amount of election litigation has more than doubled from about 96 cases a year before 2000 to over 200, about 239 cases per year after 2000, peaking in presidential election years. And if you saw the cover of the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal today, you know that we're in the midst of more lawsuits over elections. And this has an effect on voter confidence. So here's uh, some studies of how confident are you that your vote's going to be counted? Or do you think the voting process is unfair or very unfair? So in the period of 1996, we have a nice baseline before Bush versus Gore. About 10% of the people thought that the uh, election, uh, the way the election was being done was very or somewhat unfair. You compare that after 2000, it spikes with Democrats at 44%, uh, even Republicans at 25%. And by 2004, when, when Bush beats Kerry, Democrats 21 uh, percent of them think the election, the way the election is run is very somewhat unfair compared to only 3% of Republicans. But what can we learn from that? We can compare this to what happened in Washington State, where there was a gubernatorial race, where first the Republican was declared the winner, then there was a recount, the Republican was declared the winner again, it went to court and the Democrat was declared the winner. There, 68% uh, of Republicans thought the process was unfair compared to only 27% of Democrats. The message is simple. If my guy won, the election was done fair and square. If your guy won, it must have been fraud or incompetence or shipping. And so confidence in the election system is fragile and moves depending on people's confidence and the results. And so here's a troubling poll from Pew. By race, how confident are you that your vote will be accurately counted? 63% of whites, only 30% of African Americans. Not at all confident. 8% of whites, 29% of African Americans. So people's confidence in the election process, uh, dividing by race. So what's happened after Florida? Allegations of voter fraud, of voter suppression. We have problems with partisan local election administration and technology issues. I'm going to talk a little bit about each of these. And finally, I'll talk about the rise of social media and how that might change things. The big fight, of course, the one that we see the most in the news is the fight over voter identification. Voter identification laws, owners voter identification laws, started being put in place in the middle of 2000s and really picked up after 2008 when the Supreme Court rejected a constitutional challenge to Indiana's law. Well, what's it based on? How much fraud is there uh, when it comes to uh, elections? So here's Mario Gallegos, who is a state senator in Texas. Uh, he uh, had a liver transplant, and he was having complications from his liver transplant, and he was in his uh, hospital bed uh, in Houston, but he had to be transported to the Capitol Rotunda in the Texas legislature to be able to be wheeled in to vote, to filibuster the Texas voter ID law. This is how bitter the fight over voter ID was. He said, it's partisan. It's the old Karl Rove trick. The Republican Party is seeing census numbers that the Latino community is voting in record numbers, so it's a last gasp to suppress the vote. After years of Democrats fighting the Texas voter ID law, it finally passed. 
Rick Perry signed the law and said, with the signing of this law, we take a major step towards securing the integrity of the ballot box and protecting the most cherished right we enjoy as citizens. Not so fast said Eric Holder, Texas being subject to Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, the Department of Justice blocked the law. Said that it was, uh, he said, there is, there is not a lot of voter fraud, and this law is going to suppress minority votes. And just last week, a three judge court agreed with Judge Holder and put that law on hold. This case is heading to the Supreme Court, although not before the election. <coughs> the fight over voter ID. Where did it come from? Why do we think that there's such a problem with uh, voter fraud that we need to have these new identification laws? Well, in the book, I trace the history of a group called the American Center for Voting Rights, which literally sprang up from nothing two days before a hearing on what became the Help America Vote Act. And the purpose of this group appeared to be to claim that voter fraud was rampant and it required uh, passing new laws which were going to make it harder for people to register to vote and to vote. And there were racial undertones to uh, this group. And so on its webpage, which the website has now disappeared, by the way, and the person who started the group has wiped his work uh, on this. He's a very prominent lawyer in Washington. He's wiped his work for this group off of his resume without explanation. And his Wikipedia page was changed by his law firm, if you tell where the IP address comes from, to remove references to this group. What's his name? His name is uh, Thor Hearn. Uh, now he's at Orange Fox, but he used to be at a firm in Missouri. Uh, racial undertones, talking about the NAACP engaging in voter fraud, talking about Jive F. Turkey Jr., oh sorry, Senior, Junior was later, Senior, uh, registering to vote, and at least one individual being paid for paid to register voters with crack cocaine. A clear uh, message here. And the message got picked up that voter fraud was a big problem. Here's Michelle Malkin just before the 2010 midterm election. Denial is not just a river in Egypt, it's Democrats' coping mechanism for midterm election voter fraud. Faced with multiple reports of early voting irregularities and election shenanigans, left wing groups are playing deaf, dumb, and blind. Voter fraud? What voter fraud? She made those comments just before the 2010 election. That's when Republicans gave that shellacking to the Democrats. Do you remember that? How much did she talk about voter fraud after that election? Not at all. So when voter fraud happens, it's got to be done by Democrats. Those are the only ones who tend to benefit from it. Here's Dick Armey speaking in Orange County, California, just before the 2010 election. He claimed that 3% of votes were cast uh, as fraudulent Democratic ballots. I'm tired of people being Republican all their lives and then changing parties when they die. <laughs> How prevalent is this? So if you think about the kind of fraud that a voter ID law prevents, the only kind of fraud that voter ID prevents is impersonation fraud, where somebody goes to the polls and claims to be somebody else. It's a really dumb way to steal an election. If you want to steal an election, I'll tell you how to do it. Two ways. One, bribe the election officials. Two, uh, use absentee ballots. With absentee ballots, you can collect them. You can pay people, verify how they voted, and collect enough to make a difference. Maybe not in a presidential election, but a local election. And every year, we see problems with absentee ballot fraud. Yet we don't see any proposals to cut back on absentee ballot fraud uh, through eliminating absentee ballots and probably because there's a partisan benefit to absentee ballots on the Republican side, but not on the Democratic side. So the claim is that you need voter ID to prevent impersonation fraud. So I'm going to figure out who's not going to be at the polls that day. I'm going to go to the polls. I'm going to claim to be somebody listed on there, hope that the person who is checking me in at the polls doesn't know that name and say, you're not that person. And I'm going to do this with enough people who I'm not going to be able to verify what they do because I can't go into the polling place with them, that I'm going to change the outcome of elections. So I looked, and for the last generation, I could not find a single case that was even close where impersonation fraud could have affected the outcome of an election. Yet every year we have cases of absentee fraud affecting elections. In uh, California, not far from where I live, in Cudahy, a small town, it turns out that they were uh, getting the absentee ballots returned to City Hall. They were steaming them open, finding the votes for the incumbents, resealing the envelopes, finding the votes for the challengers, and throwing them away. Okay, that's the way to steal an election. But through impersonation fraud, where is it? So here's Hans von Spakowski, who writes a column for Fox News and does a, a, a longer scholarly paper for the Heritage Foundation where he says, you don't have to look far to find uh, evidence of uh, fraudulent ballots, uh, impersonation fraud. And he t pointed to a 1984 district attorney report out of New York that showed uh, uh, extensive registration and impersonation fraud between 1988 and 82. That 68, excuse me, in 82. First of all, put aside the fact that 1682 is not very recent. 
I wanted to see this report. So I wrote to Von Spakovsky, who had written to me a number of times before to try and get me to post things on the election law blog, and he didn't respond. So I wrote to the head of the Heritage Foundation and said, you know, scholarly research requires you to share your data so it can be verified. No response. So I went to Talking Points Memo. They ran a little story about it. All set to be on Maddow. This is going to be by big moments in the sun. <laughs> and then I have to blame uh, Joy Schumacher, who is the uh, UCI law librarian, who was able to find someone at the Brooklyn DA's office who actually found the report. Uh, people have been looking for years for this report. Von Spakovsky wouldn't share it. And the report showed no impersonation fraud, except that done with the collusion of election officials. And of course, if election officials are there, it's not going to make a difference. What did it show? People hiding in the Brooklyn Board of Elections in the ceiling, in the bathroom, waiting for, this was in the 1970s, waiting for the uh, lights to go out so they could go down and change voter registration cards so that if there was a later election contest, they could show a mismatch of signatures. Okay, I, that <coughs> happened. It happened in the 1970s, but it doesn't show any need for voter ID. So, so what is this about? Uh, the Bush administration made preventing voter fraud a key component of what it was doing at the Department of Justice. And the New York Times looked at this. Over five years, almost no evidence of voter fraud. 86 cases, 43 of them, I believe, involving election officials. How many involving impersonation fraud across the country? Zero. Zero. Same thing in Texas. So what is this about? So here's an email that was released as part of the U.S. Attorney Scandal investigation. Email from a Republican Party official in New Mexico to the New Mexico, the U.S. Attorney for New Mexico, David Iglesias, <coughs> a lifelong Republican, uh, uh, very well-respected guy. Here's the email. I want you, basically, I want you to indict the Acorn woman for, for, for fraud before the election. You're not going to find a better wedge issue. This is going to help motivate Republicans by talking about Democratic voter fraud. So a big part of this is about um, getting the basics cited and about fundraising. Well, what about ACORN? Here's a voter registration form for Mickey Mouse. There were thousands of these. Why? Because ACORN had a broken business model. They said, we're going to um, pay very poor people who are desperate for work to collect voter registration cards. And if they don't collect enough cards, we're going to have to fire them because we need to produce enough enough uh, cards. And so these people who want to keep their jobs turn in cards for Mickey Mouse and Mary Poppins and Tony Robo. But guess what? Can't find any cases where Mickey Mouse, Mary Poppins, or Tony Robo has actually shown up to vote on election day. So yes, this was fraud, and yes, Acorn did things they shouldn't have, and it caused all kinds of problems, but not the kind of fraud that changes the outcome of elections. But this is what uh, is pointed to in a kind of bait and switch. Acorn uh, perpetuated this registration fraud, therefore we need voter ID, therefore we need to cut back on early voting, therefore we need to make it harder uh, for people to register voters. Well, what about claims of voter suppression? How much does uh, the, uh, this, this um, attempt to make it harder to vote, how much does it actually affect the votes? So there was a great story that came out after the Indiana law came into effect about these 80 and 90 year old nuns who couldn't vote in um, <coughs> Indiana because they lacked ID. They were so old, they didn't have birth certificates, they didn't drive anywhere. And even though the sister who was checking them in recognized them, she couldn't allow them to vote. It's a great story. AP picked it up, great PR. But it turns out, if you're over 65 in Indiana, you can vote with an absentee ballot without an ID. And if you look at case after case where uh, voter ID laws have been challenged as suppressing the vote, it's very hard to find plaintiffs. Why? Because first of all, lots of people have ID. Many of the people who don't have ID are so disconnected from society, they're not going to be the ones who are going to vote. And some of those people who have ID could get ID. Is it going to make it harder to vote for some people? Yes. How many people? Well, the best estimates are that it's going to be relatively small. So here's a study that was done of the 2000 uh, election by Michael Pitts of Indiana University. 2.8 million voters casting votes in Indiana. 1,039 showed up without ID. Uh, 137 of them came back with their ID. So what does that tell us? Well, some of those people of that 1,039 had an ID and didn't bother to show up. And then there were going to be other people who didn't have ID who didn't even bother to show up. We don't know. The best estimates are probably we're talking somewhere around maybe 1%. And it's turned out that's going to skew Democratic. Because people who are poor or minorities who are older are going to tend to be voting Democratic. But not in the millions. So here's a Brennan Center study. Very careful study, I would say. 
study, new voting restrictions may affect more than 5 million. I don't know who wrote the headline, but whoever is writing it, uh, Janine, I think, wrote the headline. Very careful headline, but I want to show you what happened to it. Okay. Brennan said a millions of voters impacted, so now he not may affect, impacted, to 5 million votes have been targeted by the GOP team <laughs> of election engineering, and my favorite one at Rolling Stone, GOP Warren voting new laws could block 5 million from the polls. And so this 5 million number is now taking on magical significance as though 5 million voters are not going to vote. So if you go back and you look at the Brennan Center study, over a million of those voters are early voters in Florida who are not going to be able to vote on the Sunday before Election Day. It doesn't mean that all million of those voters are not going to vote. It's going to be harder for them to vote. Some of them won't vote. In fact, some of them won't vote even, wouldn't vote even if we had early voting on Sunday because there's less enthusiasm on the Democratic side than there was in 2000. But on the left as well, here's a Donna Brazil fundraiser, uh, fundraising letter that says, look, my sister was disenfranchised in Florida in 2000. They're trying to suppress our vote again. It's being used by Democrats as well as a way of trying to get turnout up and to fundraise. And but voter that, suppression... That's true. Hold on. We'll, we'll open it up. <laughs> um, voter suppression efforts sometimes backfire. So a uh, great example here. Um, is uh, in New Hampshire, I think it was 2002, uh, there were some phone banks set up at some local unions and firehouses uh, for <coughs> people to call who needed help to get to the polls. Well, some dumb Republican operative who used to be in the Marines said, I know what we should do, we should disrupt their communications. So he hired a firm to jam the phone lines of the Demo th these, uh, this, uh, uh, this measure, uh, these, uh, th these phone banks. Within an hour, the Republican Party got wind of what was happening, and they shut it down. We don't think maybe 10 people didn't, didn't get through in that hour. It was 7 to 8 in the morning. Um, but yet Democrats made political hay of it for a decade, and ultimately got uh, a large uh, settlement for it. Um, Justin Levitt, who used to work here, shared this flyer with me. Vote at the polling place of your choice. This was distributed in dorm rooms five different places to vote. Of course, if you don't vote at the, your right polling place, your vote doesn't count. Uh, some of this happens. Does it actually suppress a lot of votes? We don't know. But there is a tendency on the part of, uh, the, uh, on the, part of the left to exaggerate the amount of suppression. All right, other problems with elections, partisanship and localism. So here's Ken Blackwell, who was the uh, 2004, uh, in 2004 he was the uh, Secretary of State of Ohio. He did a number of things that seemed to help Republicans, including rejecting uh, voter registration forms that were not printed on heavy enough pieces of paper. That was uh, really important for voter integrity. And then there was Jennifer Bruner, the Democrat who came in, and she rejected absentee ballot forms submitted by the uh, McCain campaign because the, the voters on that form didn't check a box affirming they were citizens. It was a box that did not have to be checked under state law. It was just added by the McCain campaign. That was later reversed unanimously by the state Supreme Court. Jennifer Bruner came into office and said she was going to be a different kind of politician. <coughs> Nobody was going to know her name. She was going to be you know, acting in such a fair way. And of course, she was the poster child on uh, Fox News. John Gibson, someone is trying to steal your election, Jennifer Bruner. And now, where are we? John Husted, or Husted, I'm not sure how you say that. He's the current Secretary of State, and he's in the middle of some fights. The jury is still out on him. And we could talk about him uh, during the, the Q&A what's going to happen in Ohio. Two very important cases, the ones I see as most likely to make it to the Supreme Court before the election, on election rules are coming out of decisions he made, he's made in Ohio. But aside from the problem of uh, partisanship, there's the problem of localism. I already talked about Kathy Nicholas and the votes stored on her laptop. Well, how about <coughs> other evidence of local incompetence? So in, in Ohio, if you vote at the wrong precinct, your vote doesn't count. And it doesn't count even if the reason you went to the wrong precinct, which might just be a different table in the gymnasium, is because of poll worker error. The Ohio Supreme Court says, tough luck. If you go and you get wrong advice, your vote doesn't count. That's one of the cases that could make it to the Supreme Court. So here's a deposition of one of those election workers uh, who sent a, uh, a voter to vote in the wrong polling place. Um, when asked whether the house number 798 was even or odd, because you know, you send, if it's 798 is even, you send them to one polling place. If it's odd, you send them to another. Odd. And why do you say that's odd? I'm sorry, why do you think her address, 798, is an odd address? It begins with an odd number. 
It starts with an odd number. Yes, nine is an odd number. Eight's even. So on election day, if someone came with the address seven on eight and you had two ranges to choose from, you'd choose the odd for them? Yes. Okay, so that how, how you did it for all the ballots on election day? To determine they're even? Yes. To determine they're odd or even, you looked at the first digit of the address? Oh no, I looked at the whole address. And you choose, if there were more odds than even, it would be an odd address? Yes. <laughs> Seven, nine, eight. Odd, odd, even, it's an odd address. Like, this is who's running our life. And you can be disenfranchised for this. And of course, we set up after the 2000 debacle, we set up the US Election Assistance Commission, only supposed to give advice. It has no power other than to give out money to fix our election technology and for advice. Um, this is the page of the Election Assistance Commission. Vacant, 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 vacant. We are going into the 2012 election with the federal body that's supposed to advise people on elections with all four commission seats vacant. What does that say about how we're running our elections? And this is a group that only gives advice, and uh, Republicans uh, have been blocking the appointment of anyone to that commission. All right, uh, I'm going to skip through some of this material because I do want to have time for, uh, for discussion with Wendy and Q&A. But I will say that uh, many people thought that the equal protection holding in Bush versus Gore, which is what led the court to stop the recount, could be used to make lemonade uh, from lemons. That is, people didn't like the result that the counting was over, but it could at least help with some kind of um, improvement through the courts with our elections. It hasn't happened yet. In fact, no Supreme Court case has ever cited Bush versus Gore since it was decided. We don't know what its precedential value is, although that's a, that may come up in those two Ohio cases. But the issue of whether Bush versus Gore requires equality and how voters are treated in jurisdiction has come up in 2003, 2004, 2006, 2008, 2010, and 2011. Eventually, this issue is going to make it back to the Supreme Court. And we don't know what's going to happen there. And then there are issues of technology. So. Florida was one of the first states to junk their bad punch card machines. They were placed with electronic voting machines, and then they had a race in 2006, uh, and all of a sudden, 18,000 votes went missing on the congressional race. And so uh, some people blamed the code inside the machines. Others blamed ballot design. So here's the first screen that people saw when they were voting. This says Congressional U.S. Senator Catherine Harris. She was then running for Senate Bill Nelson. You vote, and then you go to the next page, and you see the state election here, governor, lieutenant governor, lots of people skip what was up at the top, which was the congressional race, ballot design. And in fact, we know in another jurisdiction, uh, on Florida using the same machines, different race, the attorney general's race, people missed that one. So there's so much about technology that we don't know, and we have to improve our ballot design, which is something the Brown Center has been working very hard on. Even low-tech issues, create a problem like the Lisa Murkowski votes, the write-in votes. The claim was by her competitor, Joe Miller, that if people misspelled Murkowski on the write-in ballot, the vote should not count under Alaska law. So uh, we're still having fights over this. Um, there are some on the left who believe in conspiracy theories that the machines that count the optical scan votes have a secret code in them to give a red shift to subtly help Republicans. No proof of this, but here's a quote from the Election Defense Alliance. We cannot say with 100% certainty that 97% of the votes counted on optical scanners were subject to manipulation, but we can fairly ask what evidence exists they were not. <laughs> so I can't say with 100% certainty that the people who are concerned about the machines are paranoid, but what evidence exists they are. What about internet voting? Maybe that could solve our problems. Well, uh, that could be helpful for military and overseas voters. We have a big problem making the news. Military voters registering at low levels, hard to get their ballots back. What should we do? Well, the uh, DC Board of Elections decided to run an experiment and say, you know, we're going to try to do internet voting, and we're going to open it up for hacks. Try and hack into our system. See if you can hack in. And uh, if you can, you know, then we won't run the experiment. Four days after the experiment, <laughs> the Michigan the fight end. song started playing out of the computer at the DC Board of Elections because uh, Alex Halderman of the DC Board uh, of the uh, University of Michigan Computer Science Department, they hacked in, they were in there for four days, they changed everybody's votes, they threw out votes, they added new things, they saw people from China and Iran trying to hack in to vote, so we're nowhere near ready for it. <laughs> so the next meltdown. The next meltdown is going to be worse because of social media. And I watched Twitter the night of the recall elections, the first set of recall elections, after Kathy Nicholas had had that terrible election, 
And what we saw was that Democrats believed that Kathy Nicholas was going to steal the election. And after all of the tweets, the Democratic Party in the middle of the night released a statement accusing her of foul play. A statement they later withdrew in the morning and wiped off their website. And I don't have a lot of time for this now, but the evidence shows us that Twitter leads people to be less politically tolerant. There were even death threats against Kathy Nicholas, which I've captured here uh, on this slide. Um, social media can make the next election meltdown worse, especially when it's 140 characters. There's not a lot of room for subtlety and discussion. So what can we do to fix things? At the end of my book, I've got a laundry list of things. We could have automatic universal voter registration, a national voter ID card, which could solve a lot of problems if it was done with the government paying all the expenses, register people as soon as they graduate high school or uh, drop out of high school, national election administration, uniform technology. There are lots of uh, things we could do. But it's not going to happen because we are so polarized now, no election reform is moving in Congress. The only election reforms that are moving in the states are those proposed by partisans. So Democrats pass Democratic-oriented reform, Republicans pass Republican-oriented reform. The saving grace for this election about the next meltdown is that the odds of a meltdown affecting the presidential election are quite low. Because it would have to happen in a battleground state whose electoral college votes would make a difference to the outcome. So I propose that the answer is in religion. <laughs> This is the uh, election administrator's prayer. Lord, let this election not be close. This is, the, this is our best hope uh, for avoiding our election. Thanks.